Hello and welcome to the John Ark Show. Today, we're going to interview an airplane repo agent by the name of Ken Cage, who is one of the stars of the Discovery Channel's TV show called uh, Airplane Repo. Ken is a legend in the repo industry, and we're really going to enjoy doing this interview. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel for free. You can also like, comment, and follow us. We're going to have a lot of great celebrity interviews coming up, so make sure to click on that notification bell so you can be notified every time we upload a new episode. I'd also like to tell you about a service called HollywoodIsCalling.com. It's a great service that allows you to purchase live phone calls from your favorite celebrities, so check them out. It's something you can buy for yourself or as a gift for somebody you know. Give it a try. Hollywood is calling.com. Hello, Ken. Welcome to the John Ark Show. How are you today, sir? John, I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure. We've uh, we've enjoyed the show for a while, so uh, we're looking forward to this. Me as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Ken, you're one of the stars of a Discovery Channel show called Airplane Repo that is really growing in popularity. Uh, The show focuses on the efforts of repo agents working on behalf of the banks to repossess aircraft from all over the world. Before we begin, um, what were you doing before you became a repo agent? Well, right before I uh, bought the company, I worked for Chrysler Financial, and I did collections on high-end loans for Chrysler. So I, I did the back office side of the repossessions, and I would call the repo guys to go repo the cars. So I was on the other side. Does that mean you resided in Michigan at one point? Oh, no, I was, I, I'm always a Philly guy. Uh, so we had an office, Chrysler Financial had an office in Philly, uh, one in Farmington Hills, Michigan, and then one in Kansas City. So I was in Michigan a lot, but I always lived in Philly. Gotcha. So are you a pilot and does one need to be a pilot to be a repo agent? I am not a pilot. And I, obviously I do not need to be a pilot. Um, it's funny, we all get our, detractors on the show uh, that have things to say here and there. That's always been the knock against me is that I'm not a pilot. Mm -hmm. And my response is real simple. You don't ask the heart surgeon to drive the ambulance to the hospital. Of course. course. Um, I do the repossessions. I take care of all of it. And then once it's ready to be flown, I call on the pilots. Of course. Uh, now, Now for the fun stuff. What was the first plane that you ever repossessed? Wow. You know, uh, the first plane actually was, it was not far from me. It was in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, And it was a, it was in 2006. It was a 2004 Cessna 172. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was just a pain. Uh, Debtor didn't chase me, anything like that. Um, But the uh, FBO manager was just on the paperwork and just making it difficult because he had it locked up. Um, But, you know, 24, it's funny because we go to the beach in Rehoboth, Delaware, right outside of Rehoboth. And he actually happened to be in Rehoboth. So we actually had dinner and that's how we coordinated the whole transfer of, of the repossession. Went back to Wilmington the next day and pilot was there, took off and we were done. What percentage of the delinquent owners simply surrender their planes to you and the bank uh, as opposed to those which you have to hunt down because they won't turn the plane over? The it's probably 10 to 15 percent actually voluntarily surrender the aircraft oh wow um you know in the big bubble um 2007 through 2011 the numbers were much higher because the economy was just so bad people were just saying here take my airplane Uh, but in normal times it's a lower number how many planes do you estimate are repossessed each year in the united states what would you guess it's a low number um it, again, when we're looking at those years, right, 2007, 8, 9, 10, um, you know, it was just IRG, my company alone, we were doing anywhere from three to 500 a year. So in those busy years, we were doing three to 500 a year ourselves. In a normal year, like 2019, for example, there probably wasn't 300 done total in the entire country. What about offshore? Are there more planes being repossessed offshore or is that, is that difficult to say? It, I don't think there's nearly as many being done offshore. Um, the reason is it's much, our laws, the U.S. laws are much, um, they're set up in such a way to allow the banks to get the property back. So it's an easier process in the United States than some foreign countries. 
um, they're not as open to the self-help repossession as the U.S. is. Right. So my contacts in the DEA tell me that a lot of privately owned planes and jets are being stolen now and used by the cartels to transport drugs on one-way trips. And then when they're done, they will just leave them somewhere or dump them in the jungle. Um, have you heard about that? Is that an issue? Yeah, it was. We had heard about it. Now, we actually, IRG had the uh, Department of Justice contracts for boats and airplanes, two separate contracts. We had them simultaneously for seven years, just gave them up last year. Um, so we, we know a lot of the stuff from the same types of people as you. It was a problem in Arizona 10 years ago because we were repossessing, you know, at, at different airports there. And they were telling us, you know, certain aircraft, they tell you that those are the ones that will fly. Barons are, are known for, for being runners like that. So it doesn't surprise me that it's picking up. And I'm sure there's six or eight specific types of aircraft that are used because they're just great airplanes, can carry a lot of weight. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me at all if it was just a couple of different models. Is there a big market now for stolen planes the same way there is a big market for stolen cars? Is that a, is that a thing? Honestly, not that I know of, but I, I, I don't touch that side. Right. Um, so, you know, as far as, I mean, I'll tell you, there's a couple airplanes I've been looking for. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me if, if one of them was a stolen aircraft just because of the year, make and model the aircraft. But I haven't confirmed that at this point. If a plane owner refuses to surrender a plane back to the bank, does the bank then report that plane as stolen to the police or is that not the way it works? It, that's not how it works. So that's the biggest issue we have. Um, and that's the biggest issue on the show. If you watch what I do, you'll notice we never involve the police as far as, as helping because it's a civil matter. The police can't assist or support us in any way. Right. Um, they can be there and make sure nothing escalates any kind of violence, but they're not allowed to support or assist us in any way. Um, so it's a civil matter. What happens is if the debtor is locking the plane up, okay, so it can't be repossessed. If he's moving the airplane, I'll find it and I'll get it. I mean, our, our success rate is over 94% um, in, in 14, 15 years. Um, but if they lock it up in a hangar at that point, there's another legal process called a replevin. It's a more expensive, it's a more difficult process because you have to go through the courts. Um, but usually that's the, the next step is they'll go replevin either the logs or the, or the airplane. You can kind of go, there is like a court appointed sheriff's arrest, but that's a much more challenging and litigious longer process. So that's why the repo is always the favorite one. But if you can't repo because they're locking it up, we would just go get a replevin and have the legal assistance help us. Uh, do you guys ever repo planes from people who later turn out to be obvious criminals? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, a lot. A lot. Do, do owners put alarms and other devices on their planes to prevent them from being stolen or repossessed? Yeah, we've had, uh, believe it or not, one was actually a a broker trying to sell the aircraft and he cut the brake line. Um, really? Yeah. To make sure we couldn't do it. We've had people um, on smaller airplanes. They'll put flammable materials in the, in the engine cowling. So if you're not checking the engine, you know, you could have a fire. We had an air, a, a boat and we actually showed this on the show in the first season where they tied the, um, uh, the props and the engine drive to the dock. So then we cranked up the motors. We had a real problem. It could have been much worse. Um, the one they showed on TV was a, uh, was a rope. We actually had somebody do that with a chain in hopes that the drive and the, and the dock would just get destroyed. Um, that's why now most of the time we're getting a boat, especially we'll get a towboat company to pull us out. That's some diabolically clever stuff, man. I oh, have to man. add it to these guys. <laughs> yeah, they, they have some interesting uh, thought processes for sure. What's the most expensive plane that you have ever repoed? The most expensive plane is a, uh, a gosh, it was valued at about 20 mil, a 737. Um, the most expensive repo, we had three 727s or three or four 727s. 
that were valued about 40 or $50 million total. Now, were these planes owned by individuals or by airlines that have gone out of business? So the, the 727s were an airline, a foreign airline that went out of business. Um, so that was that the 737, it was like a, a, a wealthy overseas person. It was a corporate, quote unquote, a corporation. Um, but I think it was more owned by the, the individual through the corporation. Gotcha. So one thing that surprises me whenever I watch the show, and that is whenever somebody enters a car, they always use a key or a fob to open the door. But when I watch you guys getting into these planes, I never see you use a key or a fob of any sort. Do these private jets, do they have keys or fobs or are they just permanently opened? They have, they definitely have keys. Mm. Um, and you've seen a couple times after I repossess it, like I can pick the locks and I can use keys or order keys. I've hired locksmiths. I honestly, through the years, have, have accumulated a heck of a key chain that, that will open a lot of the, uh, a lot of the aircraft. Um, but they don't like to, to kind of show that part. Right. There's nothing we're doing that's wrong. I mean, once I take possession of the, of the aircraft, I can do whatever I want to. Right. Um, but that's just something they don't show so much on the, on the show. It's funny. One of the funny stories we had, I was working with a guy. Uh, we were in Fort Lauderdale getting the uh, Gulfstream 3. And it was 7.30 in the morning, beautiful morning. And he's up there to pick the lock and he can't get it. He can't get it. He can't get it. He's so frustrated. He's sweating. He's miserable. He goes to the car. He's going to get something else. I go up to the, to the door. I push it and it pops open. It was unlocked. He never checked it. So he couldn't move the, the tumbler. So he's actually trying to lock the door when he thought he was trying to unlock it. So I push it, open the door. By the time he comes back, he's like, how the heck did you unlock that door? Of course, I made a big fuss over it like I did something amazing and had to tell him it was always unlocked. You didn't check it first. So, um, you know, it, it, that's one of the funny things. If you're not checking properly, you just assume. Um, a lot of the times we get the aircraft when they're coming in or go, ready to go out. So they're already unlocked. But now, don't, keys. don't most planes have some kind of transponder on them that lets the authorities know where they are? Or is that something that owners can shut off really easily if they're expecting the repo guy. Yeah, you don't have to do that if you're flying visual. Um, so you can just kind of go from A to B without any issue. If you go into a, especially smaller aircraft, go into airports that um, don't have towers, it's simple to go from A to B without people really knowing. What percentage of the time do plane owners get violent with you guys and start fights? As far as start fights, I mean, I've done 2,800 plus repos of boats and airplanes, okay? Of that, probably 1,000 to 1,100 are airplanes. There's probably been 50 or 60 where they've actually violently come after us. Um, you know, I had a former NFL player who was a pilot attack us. Um, a guy hit me with his car going three miles an hour, but he hit me with his car. I don't want to lose the impact of that. Um, he tried to block us from the, the door. He hit car. you personally or he hit your car with his car? No, he hit me personally because I was standing at the bottom of the steps to go up to the aircraft. Mm -hmm. He thought he, he could block me with his car. Now, like I said, he was going three miles an hour, but I played it up really, really good. So it scared him and he took off. So we got the airplane that way. Uh, I had a guy in Arkansas chase me around a field, swinging a shovel at us. We've had all kinds of crazy situations like that. Um, but all told, it's probably, you know, 10% or so where it really gets very o physical. Do owners ever completely destroy their planes when they know the bank is coming? That's happened a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Some nice airplanes too. It's, it's, there's such a pride in owning the aircraft that when you're taking it back, you just, and it's not something we're trying to do, but the truth is they're so personally attached to it that it becomes extraordinarily emotional to them. Um, even the logbooks, like I'll, we'll get an airplane, we'll ask for logbooks. They know we can't sell the airplane for nearly as much money without the logbooks. If they give us the books, we can maximize the sale and put all that money back on their loan to make their end payment very small. They'll just, they'll light up their logbooks on fire. Like they don't even care. Um, 
What so would you estimate a, a logbook contributes to the overall value of the average plane? Yeah, it's a, we base it on a percentage. We say somewhere between 30 and 50%. That's obviously, huge. Yeah, obviously an older airplane would be a lot more because there's so many years of you know, ADs that have to be done, so many years of maintenance that has to be done properly. If you have the logbook, you can say everything was done. If you don't have it, you have to assume nothing was done. And you have to recreate the logbooks, and that's a huge mess. Hmm. Now, when you guys are, are repossessing an expensive uh, plane, for example, do the banks give you an exclusive on that repossession, or is it an open contract that goes out to the entire repo industry, and whoever brings it in gets the paycheck? How does it work? Yeah, usually, it's an exclusive. Good. Um, on occasion, uh, they'll send it out to a few different repo companies. Um, that's really difficult because we have our own processes and our own way of finding the aircraft. If somebody else is working on it, they might tip off the debtor and ruin all the work that we've done. So mm. um, for that reason, they don't like to have multiple groups doing it at one time. It's not as efficient. Now, given all the challenges uh, of the economy over the last year, uh, are the banks repoing more planes than ever or has it been fairly unaffected by the economy? They still are not doing many repossessions. Um, they shut down basically all repossessions April of last year. Really? And they still haven't, yeah, they still haven't come back and, and done them yet. They provided, they just basically gave extensions to any debtor um, because COVID obviously hit the economy so hard. So in the last, since last March, we literally have had three or four repos to do, um, and that's it. So there's an eviction moratorium on homes and foreclosures. Does that legislation also affect the repo industry? Yes. Yeah, that's why they haven't done it is because, I mean, it's bad business. It looks bad. So that's why they haven't done it yeah. literally since last April. How do repossessed planes get resold by the banks? Is there like a website or is there an open marketplace of some sort? What do they do with these planes after they take them back? So we, on the airplanes that we repossess, we sell them. Okay. We're licensed shop brokers in the state of Florida. Um, we've got a great network. Um, having done so many repossessions over the years and then also having the government contract for seven years in addition to the show, Mm -hmm. um, those things have been great for us. So we've been able to sell them and it's not as cheap as you would think. Uh, a lot of people think a repoed airplane would go for 10 cents on the dollar. We're trying to get full value. And a lot of times we'll get close. So do planes have titles the way automobiles have titles? Yes. With the FAA, everything's registered with the FAA. Yep. And does that title have to reflect that the plane has been repoed or resold in, in some way? The way it does we, with yeah, a car? Yeah, we will fill out all the paperwork for the buyer. Okay. And it goes through with the bank um, because obviously they had the lien, so they had the right to take title. Um, so we'll figure, file all the paperwork with the FAA for the buyer and then change the title over to the buyer's name. Is it wise to purchase a repossessed plane or is such a plane more likely to have all sorts of mechanical problems because uh, the owner may not have maintained it properly? So I always say it's good for a savvy buyer mm -hmm. to go through the repo route. If you're not going to take the time and the energy that's required to get the deal, then I would say stay away from it. Because what you mentioned, you know, if they haven't paid for just say 90 days, they probably haven't done maintenance for 180 days. You know what I mean? So with all that maintenance that hasn't been done, uh, you kind of have to go through the processes. Savvy buyers do great and they keep coming back. Interesting. Um, just make sure you're doing your homework if you're going to buy a repo plane. So I know that sometimes on the show, you guys will repossess a plane that is not airworthy or it hasn't been maintained and that that can cause a loss in value and even affect your ability to sell it down the road. When that happens, uh, do you uh, dismantle the plane and sell the parts and are those parts worth more or less than a fully assembled and airworthy plane? Yeah. So we generally don't sell, well, we don't sell parts. Okay. That's not our business. Again, talk about the savvy buyer, right? If we have an older aircraft that's not airworthy, there will be people who have bought, 
who will and have bought airplanes for parts, but we don't sell the part, sell them as a part of that airplane. Gotcha. Um, um, do you have a sense for how dangerous a repo is going to be before you do it based on the geography, maybe based on, you know, the, the, the history of the borrower, any warning signals, any, any, anything that shows up on your radar before you guys show up there and somebody pulls out a shotgun? Yeah. Well, so I always say we do our homework and we never know. Right. So I'll give you a quick example. Um, yeah, there's, there's been people where we've seen the, the, the um, criminal records and there's assault and there's weapons charges, this, this and that. Okay, we're looking out for that one, obviously, very closely. But there was this nice, seemingly nice woman down in Key West, had a boat, um, kept it behind her house. She knew we were coming. So, you know, there's nothing on her record anywhere that would that would tell us that there was anything going to happen. So we're going around the sidewalk at 7 a.m. to go to the back of the house to get the boat. Uh, just out of nowhere, thank goodness, but we just saw a little shimmer. She had put fishing line across the walkway with mm -hmm. hooks, eye high, trying to poke her eyes out. Oh, wow. We'd have never expected. So the one thing we always say is, like, we do the homework but we still expect the worst every time. Wow. Wow. That's diabolical too. Yes. Um, <laughs> who would have thought? Um, yeah. Do you think the show has had a positive impact on your business and your revenue or is, has there been an impact, the popularity of the show and the number of uh, repos you guys do? Not really, to be honest with you. The show has not really impacted the number of repossessions. Mm -hmm. Um, it's helped us in other ways. It helps us for the sales um, because we'll get more people interested in the sales side, um, knowing that we have aircraft for sale. So it has helped us in that way. And honestly, the, the biggest way it helps us is it helps us find airplanes quicker. Um, and it's funny because everybody's first thought is, well, if somebody sees you coming, they're going to hide the airplane. Well, not necessarily. What more likely happens is I'll say, hey, is there anybody in – you know, Orange County, California, I'm looking for an aircraft and they'll go spot it for us for before we even leave the office and say, yeah, it's sitting right there, blah, 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 tell us a story and, and help us out. So we've got more people willing to help us spot, which then makes the repo much quicker um, and much, we save a lot of time chasing and surveilling and things like that. With Is it fair to say that if they're not paying, making their plane payments, that they're probably also not making their storage payments at the airport? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yep. Can you plug into that network and get uh, warned by uh, airports that aren't receiving their, their, their payments? And this way, maybe this way you'll have some sort of advanced word on potential repos? In most cases, no. They won't do that. And they have a confidentiality thing with their clients. Now, on occasion, um, yeah, we'll get the the person say, Hey, we haven't gotten a payment in six months. This might be coming up for repo, mm -hmm. but then we have to go the back way and find out who has the loan and then try and find the right person in the bank. It's we've done that one time where it's worked out. We've actually gotten a repo from that. Gotcha. Most of the time the banks are already so tuned in. They know. Uh, do you guys do a lot of foreign repos? And if so, are there any countries like Venezuela or maybe Mexico that are just too dangerous to do repos in? Uh, well, we've done them in Venezuela. We've done them in Mexico. Uh, we've done them in the UAE, um, all the islands, obviously. Um, yeah, we haven't been asked to do it in some of the, like Iran and, and places like that. So to say there's no place, like we've done Croatia. Um, we've done a lot of places. Um, what about Detroit? <laughs> Detroit, I've done a lot. A lot in Detroit. Yeah. The weather scares me more than the people do. Yeah, that's funny. And I'm from Philly, but that that lake weather, oof, that gets cold. Yeah. So um, are you and Danny still doing repos together? Yes. He's, he actually just had a, a, a surgery on his wrist, so he's out for a couple of weeks. But he does the big cases with me still. Um, we have a good time when we do them. We need to do more. Is the airplane a repo business getting more competitive now because of the popularity of the show? Not really. No, there's just not a ton of a ton of them right now. I think 
we're probably by the end of this year, end of third quarter, into the fourth quarter, we're, that's when we're going to see the spike. But there's really not a bun- there's not many people because it's it's a long game. People think it's a short game and it's not. By the time you know you go through all the paperwork, if you think you know you can cash in on it, by the time you get everything done and ready to actually repo, you've missed it. Right. In this, so there was a lot of boat brokers, for example, in 2009, 10, 11, thought they would get in the repo business. Well, by the time they got licensed and insured and everything else, the wave was done. And the banks don't want to deal with new repo people. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't want to be the guinea pig. They want to be with the people that have done thousands of them. And that's why we get the call. Right. Uh, is the show going to film another season or does that depend on how the pandemic unwinds? So, it, I mean, we've kind of been talking a little bit about it at this point. No, um, but you just, we just don't know what's going to happen. Um, How long does it shows us all the time? I'm sorry to interrupt. You, no, I'm sorry. What'd you say? Discovery shows the show all the time. Right. It's a great concept. Great concept. Well, thank you. It's, it's fun. Um, how long did it take you to film each episode approximately? So, you know, from beginning to end, because, they like doing a lot of backstory and they like doing a lot of additional filming. They'd have a set aside four days for each repo. Now there's a million different things that would come into play. Right. I mean, sometimes we just get it on the first day and then they're like, well, we don't have the story. So then you kind of have to fill in some of the blanks and that takes a day or two. Um, You know, some of the, the repos took much longer than they expected. So they'd be with us for four days, five days. We'd go back, have to do more research, then go back out. So it just, it really depends on, on the repo, but they, they would always say, let's make this a four day repo. Okay. Does having a camera crew follow you around during repos, is that a problem or is that sort of a, a great way to calm people down? What, what effect do you think it has on owners and airports? It's a problem. It's it definitely is. Nobody wants it to be filmed. Um, and it, it, honestly, from my perspective, I'm in charge of making sure everybody's safe. Danny's with me to help with that. Um, but ultimately, I'm responsible for Danny. I'm responsible for the camera crew. So the more people we have to look out for, the more challenging it is. And obviously, the camera crew goes so slow. Um, you know, where we can bing, bing here, there. With them, it just takes longer. And um, it's funny if, if you know my tagline on the show, it's Yahtzee. So I always, when I see the asset, I say Yahtzee. And that was a situation where the camera crew literally just stopped me in my tracks. And because they're like, you know, I'm sitting there at the fence and it was in Cottonwood, Arizona. I say, there's the plane. I could see the tail number. Let's go. They're like, no, the camera crew. No, what do you mean? No, We're, we got to go. You got to come up with a buzzword. You got to come up with something to say. You know, so I'm sitting there, I'm like, like what? Well, you get so they made me keep trying. It's like bingo, woohoo, da, Yahtzee, baby. Like, that's it. That's it. And that's how Yahtzee was born. So it's stuff like that because they fight me sometimes too hmm. to get the story. And that's where you know we butt heads sometimes, but looking out for them is just it's just hard. Well, before we go, what is the name of your company and how can prospective clients reach you online? The name of the company is International Recovery Group. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, honestly, I've got a new website. We started since the repos have been slow. We actually invented a UVC light to kill COVID and other viruses. Um, The smallest one, we just we just had to come out of the lab a week and a half ago. Um, It weighs six pounds. So. The website, I send people there so they can contact me through that website. And that is platinum, G-R-P-I-N-C.com. Well, Ken, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. I think uh, I think your show is fantastically fun. It's a, you know, it's a family-friendly show, and it's also intriguing. It gives people a glimpse into the world of aviation that they don't really see from the outside. And that's, that's always interesting. Uh, I want to wish you continued success and tell you that you're always welcome back on the show, sir. Thank you so much. It was great fun having a a chance to be with you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoy that as much as we did. 
Um, thanks again for watching. And I want to tell you that we're going to have more great celebrity interviews and more breaking news stories coming up in the future. So we want to encourage you to subscribe to our free channel and click on the notification bell so you can get notified every time we post a new story. Thank you for watching and we shall talk to you soon.